exist within these subgroups. There are some subgroups that have more access to um, resources. So for Malas, the case was that since they were agricultural laborers, they were actually in competition with other higher castes for the profession. Whereas the Medigas, who were confined to carcass removal and more at the lower end of the scale um, when it came to subgroups, they had a secure source of income, but they were still subject to lots of discrimination linked to their profession. And so what happened was um, the Malas, who had more freedom and more ability to try and seek out other professions, they were one of the first subgroups in Andhra Pradesh to take advantage of some of the new educational opportunities that existed for Dalvis. So that created a disparate access where the Malas were in a better position to take advantage of some of the quotas and take advantage of some of the new systems in place to increase representation in higher education. Um, so Zing applies in the U.S. context. And so before I go to the next slide, I'm pretty sure many of you have heard the recent news story of um, this young man from New Jersey. He is a Ghanaian-American um, immigrant, and he was recently accepted into all eight of the Ivy League schools, and he was also accepted into many more selective institutions in the United States as well. And a quote that I'd like you to keep in mind when the story was reported um, the CEO of IBY said, being a first generation American from Ghana also helps him stand out. He's not a typical African American kid. So that was a quote by um, the IBY CEO. And I'd like you guys to keep that in consideration when I show you the next slide. So this shows um, the representation of students who, black students who are of native origin, black students who are of immigrant origin at the 10 most selective institutions and at Ivy League institutions. So as you clearly see, there's a significant underrepresentation of blacks who are of native origin, where they were 64.4% and immigrants were 35.6%, whereas their population of um, the black population as a whole in the United States is not anywhere near that percentage. And the same case existed at the Ivy <coughs> Leagues, where they were 59.4% were blacks of native origin, while 40.6% were blacks of immigrant origin. And so a very similar case exists. Um, one example would be Harvard. And so this data was collected from Harvard's campus around 2000. And so in 2000, um, the blacks who were fourth generation beyond were 90% of the blacks population in the United States. But at Harvard campus, they constituted 45% of the black students there. And the first and second generation immigrants were 10% of the black population in the United States at the moment, but they constitute 49% of the black students accepted and on campus at Harvard. And so there's many things that can explain this, or many different ways of explaining this, but our point is basically to say that there's these large categories that generalize what it means to be black. And generally in the United States, there's a concept that black is black is black, which is not necessarily the case because there are huge socioeconomic <laughs> and huge cultural differences between these subgroups that should be recognized. And so um, the groups that we've mentioned, when I refer to immigrant blacks, I'm mostly referring to non-Hispanic students with two black parents, at least one of whom was born outside of the United States. I'm referring to native blacks, I'm referring to non-Hispanics with two black parents born in the United States. And I'm referring to multiracials, I'm referring to students who have one parent um, who is black. And I just wanted to clarify that a little bit. And so there's huge differences in the access to resources, which is very important in determining your educational outcomes, where immigrants are 7.8% um, points lower than natives when it comes to exposure to in-school violence, which refers back to the previous presentation and suspension of the school as well. And immigrants and multiracials also tend to live in more integrated neighborhoods. And the fathers of native blacks are 14.85% less likely um, to have college degrees and hold advanced degrees. These are some of the socioeconomic differences that lead to huge disparities in educational outcomes. And there are many different perceptions of identities as well. So not all the groups perceive themselves to be the same. So there you have individuals who are of immigrant origin who sometimes may choose not to identify as being African-American because that leads to some um, benefits for them in relation to being seen as an ideal minority group. So there are huge differences in the ways that different groups identify themselves. And so the first generation immigrants, they tend to prefer to identify themselves by their ethnic origin rather than their race. And a lot of that is linked back to the fact that identity 
identifying themselves by their race would mean identifying themselves with being black, which also means identifying with a history of historical race-based discrimination in the United States, which is something that's unique to the United States, which may not have been something that would have been a problem from their country of origin. And multiracials also tend to develop border identities. So they don't necessarily identify themselves as being black, or they don't necessarily identify themselves as being white, or any of the other um, racial groups that they may come from. And so uh, we speak about, um, I guess Dr. Responde spoke about um, student perceptions while they're on campus. And so in a survey, the same Harvard survey that I mentioned earlier, black Americans exclusively identified more with American race relations when it came to that being a motivation for them to succeed. So they were more likely than black immigrant students to identify with the racial history of the United States. Um, whereas um, immigrants were more likely to identify um, their successes or their motivation to succeed as something related to the ethnic origin, not necessarily something related to the race. And multiracial, in this particular survey, didn't place much importance in their race in relation to their educational outcomes or their motivation to succeed. And um, Native Blacks, something that's also really important to recognize, identify more with being involuntary migrants rather than voluntary migrants. So when you are a voluntary migrant, you're recognizing that you had the choice to come to the United States. You had the resources to come to the United States. You had the ability to come to the United States. So there's a lot of cultural forces that are playing. And there are lots of socioeconomic forces that play into having an identity and being recognized as a voluntary migrant versus individual who is an involuntary migrant. And um, at one predominantly white university, we also found that biracials have 80% lower odds of coming close to other black students compared to monoracial black. So again, that plays into how students identify themselves, which is really important when we're talking about the diversity rationale. And so when you say black is black is black, you're speaking about some sort of phenotype. You're speaking to how someone looks. And how someone looks can lead to lots of discrimination, but there is difference in there is a difference in the internalization of this discrimination, um, which is really important when you're considering the educational outcomes related to the stereotype threat. And so it was found that black natives are more hurt by racially charged searches. So they're more likely to identify with their race, and therefore they're more likely to identify this discrimination and be more likely to be impacted by it and impacted in manner. Whereas first generation immigrants were resistant to this sort of stereotype threat and were resistant to the great dampening effect of stereotype threat as well. And so some of our policy suggestions, the major policy suggestions, we model looking at India and um, looking at the different socioeconomic differences and the cultural differences between these subgroups. So in relation to the Indian context, there have been Professor um, Deshpande also <coughs> mentioned this, that when you have something that's not necessarily working to the best of its capacity, you don't scrap it. You try and find ways to improve it. So India has been attempting to find ways to improve this representation of these underrepresented subgroups. And some of the examples include what are deemed as quotas within quotas, or reservations within reservations. So in Tamil Nadu, it was proposed that 20% of all the reservations would go to the most backward OBCs. 20% of those reservations that you have should go to some of these most backwards classes. And in Andhra Pradesh, there was a characterization, A through D characterization, which kind of raised the hierarchy of which people were receiving some of these resources. And so we particularly believe that the United States should adopt a similar strategy. And the reason being, as I mentioned earlier, that there are huge socioeconomic and cultural differences between these subgroups. So black multiracials are, have a different experience related to other multiracials, that have different experiences related to native blacks, and also have disparate access to resources as well. And a similar case applies for black immigrants, native blacks, as well as black Hispanics. And it's not so much of a stretch to say that implementing a policy like this is not feasible, because it is, again, a logical extension of the current policies that we have and the current classifications that the DOE has. And we do recognize that with our policy suggestions, everything is not perfect. It's not a solution that's going to be the silver bullet of all solutions. It's not necessarily going to end everything.
thing, but it is a step in the right direction. We're saying that it's a way, it's an improvement from the current status quo. And so we recognize that one of the major problems would be um, the problem of self-reporting, and also the way that our categorizations currently are. There may be, in relation to um, multiracial blacks, say with Caribbean parents, they would be um, considered black multiracials in our categorization rather than black immigrants, that could be. So there are some individuals who might fit within two different subgroups, and that's something that needs to be a clarification. Um, but the main point being that if we fail to act right now, it might lead to the dilution of a perspective on campus, because there's a significant underrepresentation of native black subgroups, and with that underrepresentation comes an underrepresentation of the unique <coughs> perspectives that they bring on campus. And um, there is also a need for further research on this topic, especially when it comes to regional disparities, because many of the studies are done in the North and in the Northeast. So there are studies done on how West Indian um, immigrants identify themselves, like do they identify themselves to be closer to blacks or not. But that's, again, is a study that's confined to the North or the Northeast. And so we propose that there has to be more research done on this matter, especially in relation to the South. And I did find um, some qualitative studies, but they were mainly done on individual campuses. So one of the um, studies was done specifically on the campus of Georgia State University, looking at feelings of closeness between um, immigrants and looking at feelings between them and native black subgroups. So there was found to be more conversion between the two groups in the campus and in the South. It may be related to the different history of racial discrimination in the South as opposed to the North, with each region having its distinct history. And Oh, this is a big party, man. Yeah, brother, like, 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 like,